Hello everyone, so I've got a special guest here today. Now I've had him on the show before. He's Father Robert McTague. He does a show every weekday at 5 Eastern called The Catholic Current. He's a Jesuit priest and a public intellectual, but he's also a personal friend. He's authored several books. I believe I interviewed him once about a different one. That one was Real Philosophy for Real People, Tools for Truthful Living. But now he came up with a new book called Christendom Lost and Found, Meditations for a Post post-Christian era. Father McTague, welcome back to the show. I'm very glad to be working with you again, and I'm delighted to see that you're back in the saddle. Thank you. Me too. It's been a long road. All right, so actually I did really enjoy uh, your most recent book. It was an easier read than, than the past one about philosophy, and it also kind of mm -hmm. uh, more interacts with what I do talking about culture, which is kind of something that I've spent the last six months or so more focusing on. Uh, one thing I do like about the book is its willingness to kind of give an honest assessment of where we're at. It's not arguing that things aren't that bad, you know, which is what so many like to do. Uh, it's acknowledging where we are, what our direction is, and asking the sort of question as to where we ought to go from here. And I, I can't think of another work or author that's doing that right now. But you assert that things are going to get worse for Christians going forward. Why do you think that, and and what can we expect? Well, you know, I think of our, our suffering Christian brothers and sisters in China and Nigeria. Do I think we're going to be there in the United States on some soon-to-come rainy Wednesday afternoon? No, I don't, of course not. But, you know, uh, recent electoral results, uh, several states uh, enshrining the, the so-called right to abortion in their constitutions. Uh, this, the state of Montana voting against a Born Alive Protection Act that would require medical care for children that who have the learned. temerity to survive their own abortions. That tells me that the things that Christians are really committed to, uh, the sacredness of the individual, the dignity of human life, the integrity of the human body, true freedom of conscience, and both the freedom and obligation to hand on the torches of faith and reason to the next generation. These are unwelcome in, in the culture that is, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, generating, metastasizing before our, our very eyes. Uh, also, at, at the same time, uh, the economy is, is in a downward spiral. It's going to accelerate. I think the life expectancy of the American hegemony petrodollar is very limited, and we're going to have to have someone to blame. Uh, I think uh, Christians are going to be a, a very obvious target for, for that. Uh, when we start talking about domestic terrorism, some of the other words used, uh, bandied about are, you know, white supremacy and Christian nationalism. Those phrases are going to be associated in the popular mind. And who knows, someone might take it into his mind to jump into an SUV and uh, drive into another crowd. Uh, when I think of all of the, the churches and the crisis pregnancy centers that have been vandalized, been firebombed, that have been desecrated, and really not much of a trickle of public outcry and very little federal action as well. That indicates to me that Christians, especially fervent Orthodox Christians, are, are no one's priority. And we're going to find out in a hurry that we're not welcome. And that's why I, I wrote the book. I, I wrote it between November of 2019 and February of 2021. Uh, I had time in my hands when I closed the churches. Right. And I said, things aren't right. Things are going to get bad. And I'm going to take my 40 years of religious life and academic life and use that to analyze what's going on. So this is my best take of this is how we got here. This is where I think we're trending, and this is what I think the options are for faithful Christians. Okay, so you seem a lot more, I guess, aware than the average person, certainly, of just how much persecution is going on. Because I think that if if I were to go up to somebody, you know, on the street and ask them about Christian persecution going on in the United States today, they might just laugh at you. I don't think they think it's happening. They don't hear about the crisis pregnancy centers that are being firebombed. You know, they don't hear about any of that. And I think maybe that's a bit of a part of the problem is that people don't see where we are because there's no media exposure on these things because Christians are, are already allowed to be targets, at least in, in, in the sense of the media and the way it covers these things. 
Uh, well, part of it is, honestly, it's, it's a matter of an enlightened self-interest. When I b begin to see that how I dress and where I live bear a striking family resemblance to the places that have already been attacked, that sort of thing focuses my attention. Also, you know, working in media, uh, I have to be better informed than most people. I wish I didn't know a lot of the things that I know. And also, honestly, having to preach in public uh, many times uh, a month, I have to keep right. my congregation informed uh, about about what what's going on. So, and because uh, Christians are not a politically preferred group, because we're we're not identified as a victim group, and sadly in our culture now, victimology is the coin of the realm. Because we don't have an, any of that, I think we're going to continue to be targets, and I I think that that. Uh, it, it's it's going to get progressively ugly, uh, especially as the the economy begins to contract. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. I I don't think that most preachers and priests are doing their their duty in terms of informing their congregations. I think that is an area in which I mean you you often have preachers now who don't want to talk about the the issues of the day, uh, including things like abortion, especially. I think they don't want to talk about that from the pulpit. And it seems like so many are shirking their responsibility w when they avoid these issues and when they avoid what's going on uh, in terms of Christian persecution because they fail to in inform people as to what's coming. Well, you know, I, I'm in touch with... Uh... Christians from you know across the the religious spectrum, and I'm in touch with clergy and congregations from uh, across the country, and I hear a lot. And because the churches were in a demographic and financial spiral even before the ascendancy of COVID, time, COVID has accelerated that process. the The leadership, for the most part, is trying to have uh, kind of a user friendly model that we're gonna be warm and fuzzy and gauzy. We say words like welcoming and listening and aspiring to be vibrant, uh, <laughs> rather than preparing people for persecution or even acknowledging the perennial truth that our souls are being contested for between heaven and hell. Uh, and what I'm hearing from a, a, a lot of uh, newer pastors is, they're dealing with congregations who want to be entertained rather than prepared for, for spiritual warfare. Uh, so I think there's kind of a, a, a conspiracy. Uh, you know, people will show up and they'll put the envelope in the basket on the condition that they're not challenged and the preacher doesn't take too long. And then the preacher agrees to try to be entertaining. Uh, to not be overbearing, and you know the the business wheels just keep on turning. But here's what I believe firmly, and I've preached this from the pulpit many, many times. We're going to find out very soon that even lukewarm Christianity is too costly, and that from a legal and a social point of view, and we're going to find out very soon that that lukewarm Christianity is utterly insufficient for helping the faithful remnant to be faithful and and the remnant. So we're going to have to decide very, very soon. We're either going to be all in for Christ, not pretending, but the practical atheism of, of business Business as usual, 39 minutes in the pew at St. Typical's or Our Lady Help of Suburbia, that, that's on life support. It's not going to last. You, you said that we're not really talking about the perennial truths, such as the fact that our souls are being contested for. But in order to talk about those, you have to sort of exercise some degree of judgment on individual lives and how people are acting, how they're living out um, their Christian life, right? And I don't think people uh, now want to, want to be judgmental right there's this there's this idea in society that it's wrong to exercise some discernment it's it's wrong to cast judgment on an action even if that action is sinful and you you kind of see that being mirrored throughout churches with preachers saying such things as you know that emphasizing the whole don't be judgmental and not really talking about how people should be sh should be acting i think it's an easier way to go to want to be liked rather than uh, than to be right or to speak the truth what do you think well, you know, remember from my last book, Real Philosophy for Real People, there was McTague's axiom, which stated, most institutions would rather die than admit that anyone ever made a mistake. And then there was McTague's corollary, which stated, most people haven't matured past the age of 15 and are still desperate to be invited to sit at the cool kids table at the high school cafeteria. So that desire to be liked and that 
unwillingness to admit that sometimes we messed up, that's not good for institutions, communities, or individuals. And yet this is this is where we are uh, right now. And here here's a paradox. The people who, who clutch their pearls and retire to their fainting couches because someone might be judgmental, they like endorsing the word prophetic. They like taking prophetic stances, whether it's, uh, you know, the southern border free for all or eliminating plastic bottles from our retreat houses or, or painting a, a halo around Greta Thunberg. Somehow that's prophetic. But what is the role of the prophet, especially in Hebrew scriptures? The role of the prophet is to pronounce God's judgment on the present and to let people know there's a fork in the road. There's repentance and blessing, or there's persistence in sin and consequences that no one's going to like. That's the prophetic stance. And I think a real prophet always accepts the burden of prophecy very reluctantly. And the real litmus test of a true prophet is, does he sound like John the Baptist? Does he point to Christ and say, he must increase and I must uh, decrease? I think it's an obligation of Christians who've who've got who've reached the age of reason to say some things are are good for for the human person and body and some are not and we can say some things are consistent with what the church has always taught and some are not so these were truths that I used in the year and a half that I was writing the book to look at what was going on in the world and say I don't like this yeah. I don't think God likes this either. We have some choices to make. Okay. Uh, let's talk about this term of Christendom. You used it in the title, you used it a lot throughout the book. But it's a term that people don't use much anymore. They're much more in inclined to say the West or Western civilization or European culture. Um, what do you think it is? Because I think that your decision to use the word Christendom and use it so reliably um, probably was not accidental. Well, you know, there's there's a, a Jesuit tradition. Ninety seven percent of the Jesuit saints and blesseds are, are martyrs. Uh, we tend to be provocative rather, rather than coy. Uh, I think that it's a word and a concept that needs to be reclaimed. Now, it's true that Christianity has a historical roots and branches. Uh, it was planted in Jerusalem. It took firm root in Europe, and then it extended its good branches and really candidly its good fruits to the rest of the world. So yes, Christianity is incarnational. It began in a time and place. Its meaning and its mandate is universal. It is for the whole world. It is for all of creation. And I uh, start my clock, so to speak, for the book with the French Revolution, 1789. France which used to be known as the eldest daughter of the church. Let that sink in. The eldest yeah. daughter of the church. The French Revolution said, hey, here's a great idea. Let's organize life without Christ. Public and private, formal and informal, large and small, Christ has to go. It'll be great. And what used to be known as Christendom and ultimately the rest of the world has been living in the aftermath ever since. Heller Belloc was right. It is Christ or chaos. And what the French Revolution bequeathed to us ultimately, is, as I said in the book, is a, a lot of bad art and even more dead bodies. I think that we may kind of run into a bit of a problem here with the fact that so few are taught a good history. And what I mean by that is when people think that about the French Revolution from an American perspective, the very common sort of American perspective is, well, they had a revolution after we did, and we like ours, and so theirs was also good, and that it was in some way right. among the, some of the same same terms, and I don't think that's fair. And so I kind of think that just no. to some degree people may, may lose you there. Can you elaborate a little bit? Sure. You know, the aftermath of the American Revolution was the Constitutional Convention. The aftermath of the French Revolution was known as the terror. You know, discuss. Use both sides of the paper if necessary. Right. Uh, no, it was it was it was monstrous. You know, go through through churches in France and see all the decapitated statues. Right. Right. That's 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 where that's where we are. Uh, we didn't have mass executions after the the American Revolution. No, the the French Revolution was an inversion of the the Christian heritage, and in a certain sense, the the cultural engine of Christendom had developed so much momentum that even when it received a grave 
wound from from Martin Luther in the aftermath. It kept on going in terms of promoting education, the rule of law, yes, the sciences, uh, you know, the types of reliability that allows us to have a functioning economy. And that momentum, uh, that inertia, if you will, has continued until this day. But oh my goodness, we're running out of steam. Right. And the illusion that we could have a culture, a civilization, a humanized polity worthy of the name, uh, that's become a parasite feeding off the carcass, the remnant uh, of Christendom. Let's not forget that when the European Union was getting started, in the preamble they talked about the sources of European cultural identity. There was a positive choice, not to mention Christianity at all. Right, and it's like, how now, do even you... If you were a v I, I, it would be like talking about the history of China, but never mentioning the emperor. Yes. How is that possible? So even if you were a great galloping atheist, I mean, there used to be a better class of atheists. I mean, Bertrand Russell would not have tolerated the idea that we could talk about the founding of Europe without mentioning Christianity. Yeah. So in terms of the spiritual warfare, we have a war against uh, creator, creature, Christ, and church. Uh, and the idea that uh, we can be, remember in, in the Chronicles of Narnia, the Christ figure Aslan the Lion, is he tame? Well, no, of course not, right? Christianity is not meant to be tame. It's not something that we put in the crate while we're recording and then we let it out and run around when it's cute and then we're done with it, we put it back in the crate again. That That's not what Christianity is, is meant to be. And I think one of the sad things of COVID tide is that uh, the business of churchianity, the, the pale, pale imitation of a really robust Christendom w was ready to come to heal and, and take commands from the Leviathan, from, from the state. And, and the, it's not good. I'll put it that way. It's not good. Yeah. And I think there are plenty of people who, who I hear uh, including atheists who often say t to me some variation of, well, I'm not Christian, but I agree with Christian values. And it's an interesting point because they at least see the underpinnings of the West were Christian. They at least see that far. But they only mean it up to a point. They only mean those Christian values up to a point. They only mean them up to a point where it gets controversial, where it gets difficult, because it's right. not... I, I think there's this modern sense that it's in some way easy to be a Christian, uh, and I don't think it is. I mean, not if you are actually outspoken on all of those values in our modern culture. And the people who try to sort of divorce Christian values from Christ uh, end up in this, this kind of situation where it's just like your cowardice is not enough to build a civilization on. Uh, and that's, that's, that's the way I can really see it. <laughs> Well, you know, it, it's it's Christianity without the cross. It, it's the warm, fuzzy, uh, right. uh, effeminate G Jesus, the bearded lady. You know, Jesus, my girlfriend, uh, right. and, and and that's that's nonsense. You know, Saint Paul says we preach Christ crucified. You know, the cross is a sign of contradiction. You know, I, I think of of the late Cardinal George, who was only partially quoted. Uh, shortly before his death, he said, you know, I expect to die in my bed. I expect my, my successor to die in, in, the, in prison and his successor to die in the arena. And then they cut the quote off. But the rest of the quote says, and I expect that one successor to uh, pick up and rebuild civilization from the ruins, because historically that has been the role of, of Christianity. Uh, I think we're at a point now where I say we have very few public friends, we have very few powerful friends, and we have arrayed against us enemies, secular, sectarian, and spiritual, who want Christians either compromised or silent or silenced or dead. And in right. that, the, in that context, it's fair to ask, what do we need to do as individuals and as communities to remain faithful? And as far as I can tell, very few people are asking that question, especially people dressed like me. Right. And I think that one of the mistakes that people make when they start creating a project like yours, like, like your book, is that uh, they start looking back for a specific era that we should be turning back to instead of just trying to sort of re retrieve the best of Christendom. Do you agree with that? 
They're looking for well, utopia, you know, I, so to I, speak. I, I, I'm, I'm at pains. I, I say very uh, deliberately. I'm not talking about any good old days or golden era. I mean, since Adam and Eve fell, there hasn't been a good old days. We've been dealing with right. we've been dealing with sin ever since. And, you know, whatever era, you know, whether it's it's the 13th century and the era of, of Aquinas, uh, King Louis of, of France, you know, Louis St. Louis the Nine, wh whatever it is, there were sinners there. Yeah. Right? And if I were there, I certainly would have been one of them. The, the point is this. There was a time when we had a clarity about good and evil, right and wrong. We had a clarity about what is true, good and beautiful. We had a great clarity about what God offered to us and what we owed to God. And in the absence of that clarity, which really began to accelerate since the French Revolution, you know, uh, bad art and dead bodies. Uh, and and we are not, we are being fundamentally unjust to God by not giving him his due. And we are betraying the blood of our martyrs, we're betraying the existence examples of the saints we honor and the saints uh, only known to God when we fail to hand on what our heritage has given us. So I would say, look, what do we need to become clear in our own time and place? All this nonsense about, oh, you can't turn back the clock. Well, no, of course not. You know, this is not an episode of Doctor Who. All mm -hmm. right. But w what we can do is learn from our mistakes. And what we can do is learn from the people who were faithful and then take those lessons and apply them into our own here and now. So I don't think I'm rightly uh, could be decried as being merely nostalgic or, you know, pining for the glory days of, of the 1950s, which had their problems, by the way, to be sure. Right. Uh, no, uh, but we are an heir to wisdom. We are heirs to the building blocks of a genuine Christian civilization. We're dying without using our heritage. Let's come back to sanity. Let's come back to Christ. If you'll forgive me for interjecting a bit of a political reference here, but there seems to be a little bit sure. of a parallel between you're talking about let's, let's sort of bring the best of Christendom, as it were, versus those on the left who took issue with the Make America Great Again slogan that was so popular in 2016. It was Trump's slogan. Their, their point was always, well, when was America great? Right. As if, you know, people were supposed to try and defend the 1950s or, or some specific era. And then they could find a fault with that and say, see, America was never great. And of course, that was never really the point where it was like, you know, that there have been great things. Let's get back to those. There have been great values that we used to at least share. Let's get back to those. And, and I do think that perhaps this it, it's sort of this oversimplified attempt to say there's nothing great about our history because there was never a a utopian time. It kind of misses the point, and I think perhaps even intentionally so. It seems like a very disingenuous argument that I hear all the time. Well, you know, I, I talk about different narratives uh, of, of history and about how, you know, everything used to be great until 50 years ago. We'll just flick a switch and we'll make it go back. Or, you know, you know, utopia is just one committee meeting away. I mean, all that is 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 nonsense, of course. Or one election or, away. Or, or one election away. Or Oh my goodness, Christianity must be suspect because a lot of them came from Europe, you know. Shh. Uh, and and that's and that's that's complete nonsense. Look, uh, Christ is for everyone. Right? Christianity is meant to be universal. My insistent claim in this book is Christ or chaos. Those are the only options. It's really obvious that chaos is going to get us all killed. Uh, it's unworthy of human beings made in the image and likeness of God, and it is unworthy uh, of God. So I want to return to the holy order of, of the Logos. Now, that having been said, are there ugly chapters in Christianity? Yes. Yes, of course. No one is, is denying that. Let's also not forget, wherever the Christian missionaries went, you know what stopped? Um, child sacrifices. Right. right. Uh, education of women began. Right. Sure. And you had things like the, the rule of law, you know, and universities were, were well, built. Well, it's because the, the church I mean, was even, civilization. 
And there's there's this well, well, yes. weird you know thing in, in the modern age of people fail to see that connect. But when you look back throughout history, and the more that you look back throughout history, the more it's, it seems impossible to separate the two. You know, I, I a lesson I learned from my late great mentor, Dr. Paul Weiss. So here he is, um, a, a, an agnostic, non-observant Jew, studying under Alfred North Whitehead at Harvard in the early 1920s, making mm-hmm. a name for himself in symbolic logic which was what cool kids were doing at, at the time. And then he meets the great French Catholic scholar Etienne Gilson. And Dr. Weiss told me, he said, here was how the history of philosophy was taught. In the beginning, there was Plato and Aristotle. And then absolutely nothing happened for 2,000 years. And then Descartes <laughs> emerges out of nowhere, right. which, which is just demonstrably false. Yeah. Right? And so here's Etienne Gilson. So he read the medievals under Gilson, and in particular, it was St. Bonaventure, a little book called The Mind's Road to God, that convinced him of the reality of the transcendent. And he he said, you know, uh, he said, Christian thought, he said, that's that's the real thing. And he would yell at me. He says, I don't understand most of your Christian friends. He says, they're half-hearted and they're lukewarm. He said, if you can believe, you can participate in a miracle. How could you only give yourself partially yeah. to a miracle? So here is this guy who, who never converted himself but was insistent on taking Catholic thought seriously. You cannot be a serious intellectual, you cannot be an honest historian without coming to terms with the the fact that Western civilization, the preponderance of it was Christian. I mean, look at the buildings that still stand. Cave dwellers did not build that. Right. And people who participated in child sacrifice did not build that. People who educated women and insisted on the rule of law and the principle of non-contradiction, they built that. And that needs to be recovered. Um, you talked at length in the book about what you called the business of churchianity. So before we go forward, can you briefly describe what it is that you mean by the business of churchianity? I, I wish I had coined that phrase. The other phrase I use, uh, a dear friend uh, handed to me, is called the status quo ordo. And effectively, it's it's a business. Uh, we're pretty much only open on Sundays. Mm-hmm. And we let you know that there is some sort of end of life, really big trouble if you're not recorded in the attendance book. And here's the deal. Uh, I won't say anything upsetting. And I won't demand very much of you. And in return, you won't demand very much of me. And you put the envelope in the basket. And I give you some sort of liturgical participation trophy. And we'll see you again in a week. And oh, by the way, this nice building, it looks really good at weddings. Photographed in the wedding. Or grandma's going to disinherit you. You know how she gets. And so... So there's an initiation ceremony that will kind of allow you and us to obligate the kid to get photographed in, for the churchy wedding. And along the way, we'll have some rites of passage that we don't really believe in, but it doesn't matter because it's all about having the pretty backdrop for the wedding. And then when grandma finally kicks off, you want to have a place where people will sing on eagle's wings. And, and that way, and then you can get together and give and give the cheery eulogy about grandma's in heaven now. We know that because she died. And, and it's a scam. It's a grift. Yes. It's a grift. Uh, people who can't get real jobs take on this kind of work. Uh, and then some people, they're a little bit audacious, and they say, you know what? We can get the court jesters of the culture to like us if we say certain things. And then we can get Caesar to give us some of that sweet, sweet gold coin if we say and do certain things. And since the, just speaking about the United States, past 50 or 60 years, demographically, financially, the churches have been a death spiral. We've still got infrastructure to support. And those church bureaucrats, they're not going to feed themselves. As our Lord's parable said, you know, too weak to dig and too proud to beg. How do you keep that infrastructure going? We're going to outsource the corporal works of mercy. And we're going to cash in and get government coin. And I've had church bureaucrats tell me, Father, you have to understand there is no money in fighting abortion. There are other issues, however. Ka-ching. So it's that grift. Right. So... 
you know, my job is to reassure you that everybody goes to heaven. And then your job is to keep the lights on for the pretty place for your kid to get married and grandma to be buried from. That's the business of churchianity. It's painful, but okay. Um, oh, yes. And so just to kind of hit one point that you made there, you said that the churchians have outsourced the the works of mercy, that is the, the assistance to the poor, um, mm -hmm. for example, uh, to the state. Uh, what do you mean exactly? Uh, well, you know, if you take a look at uh, every diocese in the United States, every Catholic diocese has Catholic charities. Mm -hmm. The last time I checked, now my numbers are not current, and there may be some troll sure. who's who's going to gripe about that. That's fine. But the last time that I checked, most Catholic dioceses had over 75% of their budget from Catholic charities come from federal and state funds. That means that we do not have the communities to sustain the corporal works of mercy, to run soup kitchens, crisis pregnancy centers, th those sorts of things. Um, we've, we've let our communities wither and die. Only, right. I think, 23% of baptized Catholics go to Mass once a month. Two-thirds of those don't believe in the real presence of our, our Lord in the Eucharist. So we're failing at our mission we used to have parishes and religious communities that did those corporate very robustly. Those now mm -hmm. have to be managed by bureaucrats because we don't have re vowed religious anymore. And those buildings and programs still need funding. Certainly the withering parishes can't support them anymore. So we have to turn to the state. And, you know, if, if you it's an open secret. Uh, you remember I was told there is no money in fighting abortion. There's a lot of money to be made in immigration. And the number that I heard, and again, let someone fact check me, that's fine. I'm telling you what my sources told me, is that uh, a welcoming diocese gets $900 per head for immigrants for administrative costs. From the government. There were dioceses. Uh, that were suing the Obama administration over Obamacare that were getting millions of dollars from the Department of Homeland Security for citizenship services. This is a grift. Yeah. This is the business of churchianity. And, this and, is taking the coin from Caesar and expecting that Caesar's going to continue to like us. Right, which which means me to the, the mo more perhaps the most alarming part of it, which is, okay, so we're now sort of ceding control to some degree, ceding some autonomy to the state or to Caesar, if you prefer. And at some point, we, we can see a sort of escalating attacks on the faith coming from the federal government here in the United States, but uh, things are not looking favorably. Uh, toward people who actually act out the faith, you know, whether it's, you know, you're forced to bake that cake or you're forced to be the photographer at the uh, at the faux gay wedding or whatever it happens to be, or you're forced as a medical practitioner to participate in abortion or lose your job. But all of these different things are kind of coming down and then we expect, or at least you could say that the church bureaucracy seems to expect, and this is a lot of churches, uh, that somehow nothing will change, that, that there won't be any pressure that comes direct upon the church in exchange for compliance. Well, I, I think there, there are two areas where uh, the, the, the churches and churches are going to receive tremendous pressure uh, mm -hmm. from the federal government. And one is, is the transgender issue. You know, I do a lot of work in, in medical ethics for, for many years. I'm in touch with a lot of uh, doctors, a, a lot of Catholic think tanks and, and so on. And they say it, it's coming. And right. there's going to be the pressure for institutions to uh, you know, say, do gender affirming <laughs> surgery, which means agree to mutilate children. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you lose your license or you lose your, your so funding. Or, oh, yeah, yes, it is. Yes, it is. And my sources tell me that there are already some institutions who are looking for a way to, to thread the needle. You know, that somehow we're Catholic and yet we're doing these things that Caesar requires to us that just offend common sense, not to mention uh, the gospel. Right. And uh, so that, morality, that's yeah. one area where we're going to get tremendous pressure. Uh, I also think that um, 
governments really like the emergency powers they had during the COVID interruption. Yeah. And they're loath to relinquish that. And they are looking for another excuse to exercise that kind of manipulation again. I think Monkey was a tremendous disappointment to the bureaucrats. But I think they like the idea of telling churches that you are non-essential. Yes, and I think, I think there's going to be a something, you know, in my lifetime that there's going to be another you need to close down or or else. Yes, and it I would be likely we've that we've learned our that, lesson. It would be likely that it would interface with the medical sector as well, simply because the medical sector represents a sort of a, a high priest of our society now. No offense. Right. <laughs> but, right. No, no, but no, no, I, I understand. In the yeah. sense of the culture sort of worships the, the cult of science, right? Or you may call it scientism. Right. The, the people who right. are, are the scientists are supposed to be the people who cannot be questioned in modern society. They have the science. How could you argue with the science? You know, and that's that's the kind of thing. And you, you don't have that view towards any of the actual religious. You have that towards doctors and scientists who are acting at, in a sort of religious-like authority put on stage by government and exploited it in the, in the COVID uh, saga to take away people's right. basic rights, including to, uh, to enact their faith. I mean, we had churches closed on Easter. It was horrendous. You know, I, I think of, uh, you know, I, I, I talk about the cult of the expert and how damaging uh, th th that is. And again, since the time of the French Revolution, we have the idea that science is the only source of, you know, the really real knowledge. Um, and, and you know what? So much of the COVID hysteria w was based on objectively bad science to begin with. We're making policies based on tests that were fundamentally flawed. You can't draw sound conclusions from erroneous premises and corrupted data. No one wanted to talk about that. And then somehow Dr. Anthony Fauci becomes the Delphic Oracle. You know, and he's going to pronounce divine judgment on, on, and this is how we are to be saved against the, the great menace. And the unwashed and the unworthy and the heathen are the resistors. They have to be expunged from our side. I mean, if you read Kennedy's book, you know, I'm thick skinned. I'm a Jesuit. I've been around the world. I've been to hell and back innumerable times. One of the darkest two weeks in recent years in my life was reaching Kennedy's book, uh, reading Kennedy's book on Fauci. Fauci is a moral monster. And yet his Catholic uh, uh, alma mater is renaming their science building after him. No. Uh, religious communities are falling all over themselves to to bestow honors upon him. The people hysterical about systemic racism don't have anything to say about what Fauci and Bill Gates and Big Pharma have done in India and Africa for years. This is madness. This is madness. And we have to admit that not only does the emperor have no clothes, the empire has no tailor. There is no way to fix business as usual. I think that's a key point of my book. Yes, and in your book you said, the business of churchianity has positioned itself between the pincers of irrelevance and persecution. Um, so you're saying that by appealing to, to Caesar, they're diluting their own message mm -hmm. to the degree that they're irrelevant and yet uh, increasing their likelihood of being persecuted because they're reliant upon that same state. Is that correct? Right. Well, I mean, what what we're seeing is, you know, we're we're going to water down the gospel and sweeten it according to the recommendation of Caesar, by which I mean the state, and the court yeah. gestures, by which I mean popular culture and the media. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you, you can only do that so far. And then once we become irrelevant, our only use is to become a scapegoat. Yes, and and I, I think that's that's where we're trending. We're we're going to make ourselves a, a laughing stock, and then we're going to become the, the the whipping boy. And the idea that somehow we're going to avoid persecution and a hard life by emasculating Christ and hiding His cross—that's a fool's errand. That's not going to work. Christ is the narrow gate, and the narrow gate is marked by his bloody footsteps. Christians are either on board with that, or they should stop pretending. You uh, you talk a lot in your most recent book about obligations to those that we descend from. 
as a millennial, I was raised right. in an environment that really only condemns our forebears. It looks at, you know, the, the dark parts of the history emphasizes those, ignores any any virtues that might, might have been there. Um, I think I've somewhat compensated as an individual, but I do think that your perspective on looking back at our ancestors with a different lens is rare, and it might be the first time some has, have ever, like, considered the the idea that we would have an obligate an obligation to those that we come from so i was wondering if you could if you could elaborate on that a little right well i, I think one of the failures of our educational system in, in, in recent years is that students have no idea where the necessities and luxuries of civilization come from so in your own education environment the fact that you were in a building with electricity indoor plumbing a library and that you were speaking English means that you were in debt to very many generations that came before you. So that, that's that's just for, for, for starters. Uh, you know, yes, human history is complex. Yes, there are sinners and villains in every culture and every era. That's why we need a savior. That's why we need a savior. But I, I, I would say this, that uh, God made human nature to be good. We abused our free will. God decided to save us from ourselves at a terrible cost to himself. And the story of Christianity, the story of Christian civilization, is that happy marriage of nature and grace. And things like beauty, truth, good, arts, the sciences, civilization, uh, the rule of law, these are all the good fruits of people who recognize that God is is wise and good and he made an intelligible creation and when we think of the great heroes uh the the saints the founders of schools the builders of cathedrals the composers of music those monks who went blind illuminating manuscripts so the truth can be handed on they're in heaven cheering for us and when we run out of time and into eternity, they're going to say, "What did we? What did you do with what you gave? What with what we gave you?" I want to have a good answer to that question. I want my contemporaries and those who come after me to have a good answer to that question. I know that without the light of Christ and without the building blocks of Christian civilization, we only have a very bleak future. Yes. Okay. So we've we've discussed the direction that things are going. And I think that practicing Christians, you know, to be um, divorced from the churchians we discussed earlier, but practicing Christians right. seem vastly outnumbered in a culture that rejects them at the moment, just barely tolerates them. What would you say to people who are despairing at the odds that they feel like they're facing? Because it, it does seem like well, there are a lot more of them than there are of us. I mean, do you have a response right. for that? That, that's a really important question, and I was very much influenced by an essay by uh, Alfred J. Nock. He wrote it in the 1930s, I think in the Atlanta, Isaiah's Job. And this is when he was watching the rise of, of real fascism in Europe, not to mention the, the Soviet menace. And he said, beware of the, of the fellow who claims to have the big idea that's going to save everyone on the condition that you give me enough money and enough power. And he says, Isaiah was sent out to give a hard message that most people were not going to hear, but there would be a faithful remnant who would receive the message and they would be sustained. And Isaiah says to God, how will I know who they are? And he says, that's none of your business. <laughs> They'll find you. They'll find you. And, you know, in, in my own life, where, where, wherever I've been, uh, a faithful remnant has found not me, Bob McTague from Newark, New Jersey, how utterly uninteresting, but I who am uh, a being of reason, a recipient of grace, an heir to the Jesuit moral tradition, there are people who know that there's something wrong, who yeah. know that things could and should be different, and want to learn how to remain faithful in unfavorable circumstances. Wherever I've been, that faithful remnant wants to hear from me and from my library and from the pulpit and from the altar. So for people who are utterly overwhelmed, form community. One of the tricks of the enemy is to isolate us. Isolation and despair become a, a reinforcing sick cycle. We can't have that. Work 
where you are, there are people who want to pray with you as you pray. Where you are, there are people who have a good library. Where you are, there are people who have skills about planting seeds and purifying water. There are people who know uh, spiritual self and other forms of self-defense. So we start by forming communities. Uh, read, read, read. Uh, get a solid library, not an electronic library. Uh, pray together. I think, especially if you're Catholic, immerse yourself in the message of Fatima and get a group of people together to meet on Saturdays of the month. Go to confession, go to mass, pray the rosary, have a meal, exchange books, and become the leaven in the bread. And Christians meeting in the small groups, those have always been the the instruments that God has used during dark and challenging times. The, the numbers don't matter. Courage matters. Fidelity matters. Courage and fidelity are easier to live when we have community. Seek out community. Yes, there's a place for online connections. Uh, you know, thanks be to God, there are people around the world hearing what the Catholic Current, my show, has to say. I'm grateful to Ignatius Press for propagating my books. But there is no substitute for meeting face to face with people, praying together, having a meal. Form Christian community, have high standards, and plan on doing good work together in unfavorable circumstances. I think that your your point as to the fact that it, it means so much and it's and that there's no substitute. I mean, for this face to face interaction. That's it kind of brings home the point of just how big of a betrayal we saw from so many sources, you know, because you could argue it's certainly a betrayal from government as well as uh, within the churches as well. Um, those, <laughs> they broke down some of the most foundational um, parts of, of our culture and of our community by preventing people from meeting face to face and, and by asserting falsely that we can just replace it, you know, by, by online interaction. And we saw how that kind of manifests and it's really dark. But one thing I did want to kind of run by you is most of the people that I speak to, whether we're having a religious conversation or not, will generally agree with me that it seems like the direction that our culture is going is one that's simply less happy, that there's less joy in people's lives than there was during a time of more public religion. I think that's a, that's a fair statement. Um, mm -hmm. And that seems contradictory when you consider what we're what we're told. We're, we're told that with freedom comes more happiness because you're free to do whatever it is that you want. And so there's kind of like, the, especially on our side, if you, if, if you, me being our, uh, the, the kind of conservative side, it's it's always arguing in favor of freedom, and and there's a lot of that that's that's right. But just blindly arguing in favor of freedom while moving away from the faith seems to result in more misery. And I, I was wondering if you had any thoughts about that. Well, you know, we have a terribly distorted view of, of freedom. Uh, it's, a, it's a kind of freedom that immediately becomes licensed. There's, in, in the natural moral law tradition, there is uh, two, a negative freedom, freedom from. And you want to have freedom from illusion, freedom from addiction, freedom from sure. seduction, freedom from lies, that's complemented by a positive freedom, freedom for, freedom for the sake of what? Freedom for the sake of doing what I ought to do. So if I have absolute freedom, unguided freedom, you know what? I sometimes want things that are not good for me. Right. And that becomes a misuse of my freedom. So if we know who we are and whose we are. We're made in the image and likeness of God. We're rational, free, and therefore moral. And we have a God-given vocation to fulfill. Then I want freedom from the impediments of the state. And again, illusion, addiction, etc. And I want the freedom for to act and worship as I ought so that I can become fully the human person that God intended me to be. And again, in my heart, I'm a rebel. I want things that are not good. I want things that God has said no to. And, you know, I'm a slacker. 
I am lukewarm about the good, difficult things that God calls me to do. So I need to have a structure of not only rules of do and do not, but also the community that's going to hold me to account and also the community that's going to inspire me and encourage me. I mean, traditionally, a good community is one that makes it easier to be good, one that gives a positive kind of of peer pressure. Uh, the temptation is to just allow everyone to float along from, well, we all we all eat fish on Friday because we don't know why, but w- what we do. Good luck right. finding a hamburger in this town on Friday. Well, well, those days are gone. I don't know that they helped us very much. But we need to know that the absolute license that the culture is celebrating makes people miserable. I once taught a course called Sex, Life, and Love. Opening lectures, I want you to close your eyes. I want you to think of all your promiscuous friends. Now think of how many of them are happy. They'll open their eyes with tears in their eyes. I mean, the truth of the church's wisdom, just for the sixth commandment, is look at how miserable are the people who reject it. Right. That In our business, we, 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 we call that a clue. So we need to recover a proper sense of freedom, freedom from and freedom for, uh, put together. So these people who say, oh, we like Christian values, I say, you know what, your ethics needs my anthropology and my metaphysics, or you're not going to get to the destination that you think you're headed to. And then, then they make right, Thank you. I, I think it helps to kind of uh, break down some of these concepts because we've, we've lost them and we're talking about building community and you can't build community without, without these kind of understandings that I think used to be at least better known and now we just kind of have a culture that says more freedom is all we need and and then there's no direction that comes after that and you right. in, in the book you, you asked people to evaluate their own state of life and see how they might go forward uh, from from here in that you know culture isn't doing so great, you know, that things are, are doing badly, how do we sort of rebuild? We rebuild, of course, with the individual because that's all you can work with. Do you therefore think that small-scale fixes, local communities, are where we should focus rather than sort of large scheme plans? I, I, I don't know how um, the the grand scheme would would work i i simply don't i i think we're at a point now we have to confess we're beyond human remedy right right the you know we're yeah i know we'll we'll get a blue ribbon panel together and there'll be a report and it'll be great or we're going to have this rally rally and jamboree and we got this logo that we encourage people to put on their websites and that's gonna no one thing that you actually see how, how that works. Uh, one thing that kind of amused me about the book is you were talking about different groups of people and and what they might want going forward, and you talked about the more, um, well, I don't know, rebellious, aggressive people who are more inclined toward the reconquista, and that's it's kind of my more natural um, mm. uh, way of thinking about things. And then you go, but who would lead it? <laughs> that was kind of amusing because it's like, yeah, um, exactly. I can't think of anybody either. You know, I, I make that that reference to uh, you know the you know the the Lord of the Rings and the Siege of Helm's Deep, you know, and ride yeah. out to meet them. Yes. You know, and I mean, it, it makes for a great story, Italian. It makes for a great cinema. I mean, I tear up just just, just thinking about it. You know, the best defense is is a good offense. Um, but, but again, here's it. You know, wait, is it who's who's going to save us? You know, Donald Trump. Yeah. Elon Musk, Gavin Newsom. Ron DeSantis. Uh, so that the, the idea that if we only had a strong leader who would tell us what to do, um, I, I do think that there there is a place for uh, a, a true Christian boldness. You know, this is, you know, I, I think of, of Andrew Torba from, I mean, he's not fake, uh, like him or hate him, he's not faking yeah. it. He said, this is yeah. what I'm going to do for these reasons. Here's my non-negotiable. And then he did it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's no question. He did what he set out to do. Props to him for that. But Andrew Toba is is not presenting himself as the savior either. He's giving a space for communities, for natural and spiritual communities to form. And so props to him for doing that. 
I think the idea of building parallel structures of economy, culture, communication, maybe even worship, th that all makes sense to me. Um, yeah. I think, you know, writing for your local school board, yeah, do that. You know, finding out who's on the library board for sure. Uh, <laughs> let, let's, let's do that too. But really, I, we've, I think our culture has robbed us of the, the ability to form friendships. Yes. And to form communities, you know, uh, you know, whether it's, it's a, it's a bowling league. I mean, there used to, every moderate sized town used to have a chess club. Uh, you know, now you know, we've got our goggles on mm -hmm. and we're either alone or with, we're with people who are far away and, and we've never met. And that's not incarnational. That's, that's not Christian. Um, and I think over time, as different clusters of community form, they might gain momentum and God's providence might be revealed in the kind of effects that, that they have. Uh, and, you know, and there are times where we have to be bold and we have to denounce. You know, right. we have to say, no, it's not a mystery who's a man and who's a woman. Mm -hmm. It's not a mystery that men and women are made for each other. It's not a mystery what marriage is. It's not a mystery what children need from the people who beget them. Right. And we need to say that boldly, even if people make faces and even if they threaten to take us to court. Yeah. So, yes, there is a place for boldness and there is a place where we need a space to form bonds of common value and common belief and common work. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, well, Father McTay, that seems like a good place that we should stop. And I will uh, right. go ahead and implore everybody. It really is a good book. I read it twice, uh, and I do see I actually own it. Yeah, uh, Christendom mm -hmm. Lost and Found. Father McTay, thank you so much for joining me today. Do you have any last statement you'd like to make? Uh, please do read the book uh, and then read it again. There is There's a lot of there there. Uh, it's a more accessible read than my last book was, uh, but discuss it with friends. I want the book will succeed if the if the if it leads reading to conversation to prayer and, and to action. Uh, pray for me and tune into the Catholic Current. You can find it every day at the Station of the Cross dot com, the iCatholic Radio mobile app, and your favorite audio platform. And then uh, look for my name online. I write in a lot of different places. And I'm glad to see that you're working again, Sarah. God bless your good work. Thank you so much. All right, take care. Bye-bye. If you liked that video enough to make it to the end of the video, which is like superhuman in terms of modern attention spans, please make sure to share this with your friends and family. I also have links in the description so you can follow me elsewhere and you can find other videos. Thanks.